Probably one of the first tasks of an astronaut assigned to an upcoming space flight will be to meet the press, feel their searching questions, and in so doing, continue to instill great confidence in the space program. In this area of give and take, there are few persons the equal of astronaut Frank Borman. Unusually composed under such pressures, he has the ability to communicate clearly so that others can understand. Frank, is, is this lunar orbit mission too risky after only one manned Apollo flight? No, Jules. It, as I said before, if I, I, I can honestly say this. If I thought it was too risky, I don't know how the other two people feel, but I wouldn't be on board. We've uh, flown many uh, unmanned Apollos, as you know. We have uh, the, hi the system history of the Apollo is fantastic, and the testing, the redundancy, the uh, quality control, and the care that we've made, and then the, proceed the changes that we've made since the fire. I, th I think it's a safe vehicle. Gifted with a natural sense of organized thinking, Colonel Borman practices efficiency and takes pride in his ability to have a job well done. Following his graduation from West Point in 1950, he entered the Air Force and received his pilot training at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. In 1957, West Point asked him to return as an instructor in thermodynamics and fluid mechanics, shortly after he had received his Master of Science degree from Caltech in aeronautical engineering. In September 1962, Frank Borman's application as an astronaut was accepted by NASA. From hundreds of applicants, he had been selected to join the second group to be named to the space agency. Following orientation, Frank Borman and his group began their six months of classroom study in such courses as geology, astronomy, flight mechanics, and physics of the upper atmosphere. Along with other astronauts, he participated in survival training to gain experience in reducing hazards which may occur following space flight. In 1965, Frank Borman and James Lovell were assigned as backup pilots for Gemini 4, but it wasn't until Gemini 7 that year that his training and experience was used when he was selected prime crew command pilot with Lovell as pilot. But specialized mission training was necessary. The flight was to be of 14 days duration, longer than the planned lunar trip. In that time, 20 experiments were planned. Many questions would be answered, including the physiological aspects of living two weeks in space. Also, Gemini 7 spacecraft was to be the passive target for Gemini 6 during the first rendezvous in space. Launch day came. Months of training were soon put to use. Liftoff was similar to previous launches, with one big difference. Frank Borman was in the spacecraft instead of on the ground. Gemini 6 was successful in its rendezvous with Gemini 7 and came back with spectacular pictures. After the longest manned space flight in history, from December 4th to the 18th, the crew welcomed a return to Earth. Just 32 minutes after splashdown, they were receiving congratulations on the aircraft carrier WASP. For NASA, post-flight medical checkups and debriefings were of first concern. But for family men, Borman and Lovell, a reunion with their wives and close friends was next in importance. In the press conference that followed with the Gemini 6 and 7 astronauts, Frank Borman opened the session. First, let me say that I'm glad that the theme all morning has been on the, the group and the team emphasis on this mission because I think it's been evident to Jim and I from the very beginning that we've had wonderful support from every quarter. 
Of course, one of the dangers when you start to, uh, to try to outline the people that have given you the support is the fact that you, that you often forget or overlook someone, and uh, many people uh, use this as a reason for not thanking everyone. I think what I, I'd like to say is that when we use the term our flight, that we'd like to use our in its broadest sense, and we'd like to have everyone that was out on the Oilers for two weeks in the Pacific or down to the people that, that are working the midnight shift and Martin and McDonald realize that we're, we're speaking for them when we say our. As soon as the conferences were over and life became more normal, Frank Borman and his family attended the St. Christopher Church in League City, Texas, where he's a member and, when time permits, contributes his services as a lay minister. Early in 1967, NASA called upon Frank Borman following the death of the first Apollo flight crew at Cape Kennedy by appointing him an investigating member of the Accident Review Board. In Apollo, Frank Borman was selected as spacecraft commander of the third manned flight, along with James Lovell, command pilot, and Bill Anders, pilot. But in keeping Apollo on schedule, NASA switched them to Apollo 8, the second manned flight. Colonel Borman and his crew in Apollo 8 are now cleared for the deepest planned space penetration, out about 240,000 miles, and the chance to be the first humans to orbit the moon. It was a conservative mission. I didn't mean that I thought that there weren't risks or dangers involved. And, and I don't subscribe to the school that says you take more danger driving on a freeway and this sort of thing because uh, you, don't, you don't have to, uh, to study the space, space program too closely to realize that we're flying a Saturn V and we've got elements of danger all along the way. But I can't help thinking when I see that vehicle, as the booster and the spacecraft, that we're looking at the best that American technology can produce. And uh, I have confidence that it'll be good enough.